from the headquarters of Teleto English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sunny Gray. We begin in Guatemala where the first group of Honduran migrants has already arrived at the border with Mexico. Thousands more are still making their way across Guatemala on their way to the United States. The migrant caravan set off from Honduras last weekend. Honduran migrants are trying to reach the capital of Guatemala to continue their journey to Mexico and the United States. Some have opted to get on trailers since their fatigue is obvious. Despite that, they say they are not going back to their country. We are not going back, and I am not a leader. I am the people, and for the people, if I die, I die, and if we have to fight, we will have to fight. The conditions in which they are making this journey are not ideal. Overcrowding in trucks and the high temperature of the eastern region of the country has led the Ombudsman for Human Rights to demand controls from the Civil National Police to avoid children being taken in this kind of transport. Those who had begun the journey by truck now have to walk again. It is a very complicated situation because the number of Honduran people that are passing through Guatemalan territory is high. They have the purpose to reach as soon as possible to the border with Mexico and therefore they are seeking the way to transport them in a more agile way. The situation is that we know for a fact that some people have suffered accidents or harm when they get into the trucks. It's clear that a large number of Hondurans have chosen to stay on the caravan and walk thousands of kilometers to the Guatemalan capital. This mother with her three children says that the wish to have a job is what keeps her going and says her goal is to reach the United States. I left my country because I don't have a job and I have three children. I'm living with the idea of moving forward because I am alone with them. I wish that they let us pass. My idea is to go to work to move forward with my children. Hundreds have already arrived in the capital and others are arriving at the border with Mexico, all with a clear goal of leaving their country, which they say has denied them the possibility of a better quality of life. The caravan is now split into several parts. On Wednesday, another group of 500 Hondurans arrived at the border with El Salvador by taking a different route on their way to the United States. Our correspondent, Ernesto Alvalos, has more. El Salvador's migration authorities have reported that late Wednesday some 500 Hondurans arrived at the border. They were coming from the southernmost departments of Honduras with the intention of crossing Salvadoran territory on their way to the United States. This makes the second caravan from Honduras to head towards the United States. Migration authorities have said that those who meet the migration requirements of El Salvador will have free access to the country. At the same time, those who do not carry the proper legal documents will not be able to pass through the Salvadoran border. But over the last few hours, we have heard from organization of the Jesuit Church, which is not in agreement with this policy of Donald Trump, which has threatened to remove aid from countries of the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. This enlarges the crisis which began with the migration of Hondurans, whose need to leave stems from the economic crisis as well as the violence in their country. And in the last hour, President Donald Trump has again threatened Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador over the migrant caravan. Trump took to Twitter to warn that he will send the U.S. military to its southern border, border to stop the caravan of migrants. He also said he is cutting all funds to these countries, and he accused the migrants of being criminals. Now the Guatemalan president has reacted to his U.S. counterpart's threats to cut off aid to Central American countries if they don't stop the caravan. With the United States and with every other country in the world, with me in government, we have maintained exchanges at the level at which countries should have them. No aid should be conditional. No aid should be demanded. 
The Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad has met with leaders of Brazil evangelical churches just a week and a half to go before the runoff election. At the meeting, he said there are contradictions between religious values and the violence that Bolsonaro defends. Brazil is a mainly Catholic country, but evangelicals have grown rapidly in recent years. It's not about options, but the need today to take position democratically in this electoral process. What's at stake is not simply a party. It's not that. What's at stake is the issue of the Brazilian democracy. Our correspondent in Rio de Janeiro, Andre Fiera, has more from the campaign. The campaign continues for the two candidates vying for the presidency during these elections here in Brazil. On Wednesday, the candidate of the far right, Jair Bolsonaro, visited the headquarters of the National Police in Rio de Janeiro, where he spoke with officers and also asked them for their vote inside this public institution. This is, of course, prohibited by law here in this country. The Workers' Party, which is the party of Fernando Haddad, denounced this new electoral crime. Just a day before, in a visit to another police headquarters, the candidate had asked for votes, which was also denounced by the Workers' Party. The candidate of the far right has also continued to decline invitations to participate in the televised debates. And at a concert in the Brazilian state of Bahia, Roger Waters, the founder of the rock band Pink Floyd, has paid tribute to the capoeira master who was murdered by a supporter of Jair Bolsonaro. I wanted to just pause for a moment to remember one of your own. This is a local great artist. Master Mark, who as you all know was brutally murdered in the wake of the recent first round of your presidential elections. He was a great example to all of us in spreading love and humanity and empathy and courage. One person has been shot dead in Haiti during protests after a ceremony for the anniversary of the death of Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Tens of thousands of people protested to demand an investigation into an oil corruption scandal. Police officers are said to have fired live ammunition as protesters threw rocks. Social movements and political organizations want the authorities to be held responsible for corruption. Prime Minister Jean-Henri Seant has called on people to remain calm. Among those calling for the return of the squandered funds to the people is the leftist intellectual and activist Camille Chambers, who says he recognizes solidarity and contributions by socialist countries. We are welcoming the alternative cooperation created by the socialist spirit of Hugo Chavez Frias and Fidel Castro. This socialist cooperation is what must dominate relations between countries. We are applauding the solidarity socialist cooperation and at the same time we are condemning the bad use of fundings and the Haitian oligarchy, which has appropriated a big part of those funds rather than for the state to use for the benefit of the population. We are here to demand that President Jovenel Moise return the money from the Petro Caribe Fund. We are suffering too much. We can't eat. Kids can't go to school. Jovenel has to leave power, no matter what. We don't agree with violence, but I'm also not against the people out here protesting to demand justice. They're not just in the street over the Petro Caribe issue. They're also out here to say the cost of living is too high. The cost of things we need most are too high. Our correspondent in Port-au-Prince, Daisy Toussaint, has more details. Opposition leaders and social organizations have taken to the streets to protest against the embezzlement of public funds. Demonstrators want to pressure the government to carry an investigation into the corruption allegation and charge those responsible. They have also asked the police to avoid provoking protesters and not to create violence. On their part, social organizations said the government is to blame for the death of a person during the demonstration. 
But police members said they will not tolerate any acts of violence and explained that all their measures secure the country. Prime Minister Jean-Henri Seand has called on people to remain calm and trust the government. We thank Daisy for that report. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has blacklisted eight Caribbean countries. They have been flagged by the organization as operating high-risk schemes that sell residency or citizenship. Citizenship by investment schemes allow foreign individuals to obtain citizenship or residency rights on the basis of local investments or against a flat fee. The OECD says the scheme can be used by those individuals to hide their assets offshore. Prison officers in Trinidad are vowing to walk off the job in response to the shooting death of yet another prison officer. The Prison Officers Association President, Aaron Richards, says he and his men are prepared to leave the nation's prisons unmanned. Five prison officers have been murdered in Trinidad for the year so far. We'll take a short break now. More news in a minute. With developing events being presented through analysis, our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Saludos, amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y pongo usted de las cámaras, señor director. Welcome back. The Peruvian opposition leader Keiko Fujimori has been released from jail. After a week under arrest, a court overturned her detention. She was accused by prosecutors of receiving money from the Brazilian construction firm Odebrecht for her election campaign in 2011. It's been seven days of agony. Very difficult. But as I said in the hearing, it has also been an opportunity, an opportunity to start a journey to once again achieve unity in my family. And Peruvians have again been marching against corruption in their public institutions. Our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, was at that march. People have gathered in this square as a protest against corruption. They are also protesting against Congress as they say their members protect different public figures linked to corruption and their lack of action to detain the leaders of criminal organizations, White Neck. Demonstrators are also waiting for the resolution of Keiko Fujimori appeal. She is being investigated for creating a criminal network and for money laundering. Costa Rica's Supreme Court has rejected the tax reform plan approved by the Legislative Assembly 10 days ago. The court asked lawmakers to modify four items in the plan. Now the Legislative Assembly can either comply with the Supreme Court's ruling or keep the bill as is. Unions have been protesting and striking against the tax reform for over a month. Several application-based delivery riders have teamed up in Argentina to form a new trade union. They want their employment status to be formalized within the law. There are over 100,000 Argentinians working as riders, but they're not eligible for certain rights that cover accidents at work, health benefits, and retirement plans. Officials from the Provisional Riders Trade Union have already met with lawmakers 
to set up basic employment standards. This initiative is the first of its kind in Latin America. We are seeking improvement, insurance against risk because we are exposed out on the streets every day. We don't have insurance. We are also exposed to robberies, so basically we want these risks insurance. For our hours work to be recognized, the length of time we have, and that we are not blocked from the app, that we are not stopped from working without a logical reason. Workers at a museum in Argentina that showcases the history of the Malvinas Islands are protesting against its threatened closure. They say it shows the government's failure to defend the country's sovereignty. Asuncion works in the Malvinas Museum as a guide. She and her co-workers are worried that the museum is being emptied of its contents and its closure is imminent. We will leave it with a lot of sadness, but not without a fight as we have organized ourselves. We will defend the cause and the rights of the workers. People from all walks of life, including soldiers, have come together to launch June 10th to try and keep the museum and the cause alive. Macri can see this museum is a center of the resistance. He tried to make changes here. When school came to visit the museum, they found workers committed to the Malvinas cause. We don't deny this museum was created in a period of history when popular leaders from the region fought for the defense of Malvinas. As time goes by, the cause is not forgotten. People are collectively standing up to the government for giving away the island's natural resources to the UK. This government does not support sovereignty. They are working in favor of commercial interests that don't benefit people or the country. I thought we would progress as we did with the last government, but it didn't work out like that. They betrayed us and we are going backwards. Wounds are still fresh and there are some things that are non-negotiable. The decision to disregard so easily the history behind the island and to sign an agreement with the UK is one of them. It's worrying that the claim to sovereignty doesn't have strength, because since the return to democracy, Argentina has received a lot of support from international bodies, especially from UN. This support meant that the UK was isolated. People are worried that Latin America is loosened to neocolonialism. The Argentines won't forget the Malvinas cause. Venezuela's communications minister Jorge Rodriguez says seven new suspects have been arrested in connection with the failed assassination attempt against President Nicolas Maduro. There is no doubt, thanks to confessions of those questioned in the assassination attempt against President Nicolás Maduro, that Julio Borges participated and is protected by the government of Colombia. We want to announce the arrest of Mr. Osvaldo Gabriel Castillo Lunar, alias El Capi. This 25-year-old was recruited for training in Colombia to assassinate President Maduro. Many Canadians have come together to celebrate Wednesday's legalization of cannabis. People in Montreal city centre lit up in celebration after the country became the first major economy in the world to fully legalise recreational marijuana on Wednesday. Long lines could be found outside of pot shops around the country. I don't think the consumption will rise. I think people will admit they smoke. They will not hide anymore. A lot of more people will feel free to talk about it. We are not scared anymore. We don't have to fear. Six vaquitas have been spotted in Mexico's Gulf of California, raising hope that the endangered species has made a return from the brink of extinction. According to experts, the group was a mother and her offspring. The vaquita is the world's smallest porpoise. Its population has declined by over 90% in just 20 years. Word News is next. Stay with us. An occasion to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, 
traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives Friday Only on Telesur Welcome back. The New York Times has reported that audio recordings from the Saudi consulate in Istanbul revealed that the journalist Jamal Khashoggi was tortured and beheaded in the consulate. The newspaper also said that U.S. intelligence officials have circumstantial evidence that the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was involved in the disappearance of Khashoggi. The Turkish investigators have searched the consulate as well as the residents of the Saudi Council General, but haven't made their, publics, their findings public. British Prime Minister Theresa May has confirmed she is considering extending the transition period after Brexit for up to a year. She made the announcement after she failed to reach an agreement with European Union leaders in Brussels. Conservative MPs and Brexit campaigners are not happy with the idea of extending the period as it would give the EU more leverage in the negotiations. Britain is due to leave the EU in March and the transition period is set to run until December 2020. A further idea that has emerged, and it is an idea at this stage, is to create an option to extend the implementation period for a few matter of months, and it would only be for a matter of months. But the point is that this is not expected to be used, because we are working to ensure that we have that future relationship in place by the end of December 2020. Uh, I'm clear that it is possible to do that, and that's what we're working for. The number of people killed in an attack on a college in Crimea has risen to 20 after a female student died of her injuries. People paid their respects to the victims by laying flowers and candles in the city of Kresh. Investigators identified the attacker as an 18-year-old student at the college. He apparently set off a bomb in the cafeteria and then started shooting at random. He killed himself afterwards. Afghanistan's parliamentary elections on Saturday are facing doubts over security after a number of murders during the campaign. More than 2,500 candidates, including over 400 women, are running for the lower house of the Afghan parliament. The long-delayed elections were originally scheduled for 2015, but have been postponed several times. According to local media, the Taliban has threatened to sabotage the elections. There is a concern that Taliban and other elite groups illegal groups will uh, create problems in the election day and especially for the candidates, for the voters and for the observers. People in the West Bank have protested against the demolition of a village. One man injured by Israeli security forces had to be carried to an ambulance as the vehicle was not allowed to enter the village. Security forces also tasered and pepper sprayed another protester after he questioned the Border Patrol police over for arresting a teenage Palestinian girl. And now let's take a look at what else is happening around the world. The Bulgarian man suspected of the rape and murder of TV journalist Victoria Marinova was extradited from Germany on Wednesday. The 20-year-old suspect, named as Severin Krasimirov, arrived at the airport in the capital Sofia and was transferred to police detention. There, his fingerprints will be taken and he will undergo DNA and psychiatric tests. If convicted, he faces a maximum sentence of life without parole. 
The pro-migrant Italian mayor, Domenico Luciano, has been banned from staying in his city, Riace. The Italian Interior Ministry also ordered the transfer of all 200 migrants out of the town, but later said people would only be moved on a voluntary basis. Luciano has been under house arrest since early October for organizing marriages of convenience to speed up requests for asylum. His program of integrating migrants in restored houses and workshops in his dying town made the headlines. There is this theory conveyed in central and northern Italy that refugees, the privates of our work, bring us diseases, problems of public order, or disturb the balance of local communities with their religion. But in reality, we prove that it's exactly the opposite. The conservative Australian state of Queensland has legalized abortion, overturning a 19th century restriction. Until now, women have used 1960s and 1970s common law rulings that allowed abortion on social, economic and medical grounds. But now, under the new law, women can ask to terminate pregnancies up to 22 weeks. Queensland's parliament passed the new law by 50 votes to 41. In Mexico, a traditional game played with a ball on fire is helping children stay away from crime and street violence. To play Pelota Popecha, they have to hit a fiery ball through the air with sticks, similar to lacrosse. For players in Itzapalapa, an area of Mexico City with one of the highest crime rates, it helps them stay out of trouble. The game dates back to pre-Hispanic times, as depicted in murals in the ancient city of Teotihuacan. And we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisiotv.net forward slash English. And you can also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. At Talisio English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.